I don't know about you, but I am fed up. I'm fed up with the lies, with the deception, with the corruption that has hurt so many people. So I decided that it's time I'm going to start a series dedicated to exposing the food industry. I'm going to be looking into different companies, different policies that have been made around food, why we have the current structure of nutrition that we have today, and I'm going to expose all of the truth for you. It's all going to be in one place. I'm going to release episodes weekly. It's going to be Fed Up Friday, and I am going to cover a range of topics all dedicated to exposing the food industry. I'm so tired of everyone still being so brainwashed by all of the lies that have been put out there to keep us sick. So I am here to expose the truth. I hope you're excited. I'm excited. Let's get into it. Today's episode, The Dark history of cornflakes. We're going to look at how cereal started, what was its original purpose, and what it spiraled into today. So let's get into it. I'm super excited. Kicking off episode one. Let's go. All of the information that I am using and the sources that I will be citing are readily available to the public. The interesting thing I find though is that even though this information is not being hidden and is very easily accessible, most people still don't know these things. We definitely don't learn them in school. Today's episode, John Harvey Kellogg. The name Kellogg is quite familiar to most Americans, if not all, and may even be a little sentimental. So I just wanted to go ahead and apologize for how I'm about to ruin your childhood and really paint a picture of the truth behind the name of the beloved Tony the Tiger, Frosted Cornflakes. Today's episode is titled The Dark History of Cornflakes, and unfortunately, it is just that. John Harvey Kellogg, born February 26th, 1852, died December 14th, 1943, at the age of 91 years old. A devoted Seventh-day Adventist, vegetarian, prohibitionist, eugenicist, and advocator for abstinence. He, in his lifetime, was the director of the Battle Creek Sanitarium, and he was also a co-founder of the Race Betterment Foundation, following his title as eugenicist. He believed humans to be hedonistic animals. J.H. Kellogg believed that pleasuring oneself was one of life's deadliest vices, and he started a violent crusade in order to combat this at the very beginning, which was with children. And to do this, he would promote mutilating their genitals in order to free them from carnal sin. He would advise parents to tie their hands to the bedpost at night. He also promoted circumcising teenage boys or sewing their foreskin shut in order to prevent and then for girls he suggested pouring carbolic acid on their most sensitive area. What a great guy. Yeah, so unfortunately, I guess our genitals are the curse that lead us to sin, and there's nothing else, apparently, that is the cause of that. So, 
That's interesting. During his life, he fostered 42 children. I feel so bad for those kids. And seven of them he ended up adopting with his wife. Now also, allegedly, he never consummated his marriage with his wife because he was so disgusted with intercourse that he never, allegedly, he never consummated his marriage with his wife. Poor woman. Sounds a little more to me like somebody did not want to peek outside of the closet, but that's just a speculation. I don't see any recorded details of that. Now, just a little speculation here, but I just find it so interesting that he was so obsessed with child sexuality. That's just a little side note that I wanted to make because when you look up his history, it is dark and it is centered on children. I also just find it interesting with his disgust for intercourse because as a version of Christian, uh, he should be aware that not only did God create the act of uh, a man and a woman coming together, but he actually encourages it and commands married people to not withhold themselves from each other. Um, at least that's the version of the Bible I know. I think uh, what he even says, be fruitful and multiply. Um, so it sounds like God condones this act and would like people to engage in it. I mean, that's kind of how we've gotten to the point of having, what, almost 8 billion people in the world? If we all thought like this, I mean, we would have been gone extinct quite a while ago. So kind of interesting how much he uh, hated himself and other people. <laughs> That's just a little speculation there. During the 1880s, Americans were consuming very high meat breakfast. Any non-meat alternatives were burdensome to cook up in the morning and people just wanted something that was easy and quicker. So they opted for preserved meats for the start to their day, which to me sounds like a great start to a day if you do if I do say so myself, providing you lots of energy and mental clarity throughout the day. Kellogg was not such a fan of this. He believed that that was fueling everybody's carnal sin and temptation in life. He equated fondness for spicy foods, round shoulders, and boldness as signs of a chronic self-pleaser. So he really wanted to try to reduce meat consumption as much as possible in order to purify humanity of these carnal sins. Did I mention he was a vegetarian? He believed that the proper human diet consists of grains, nuts, and yogurt. And we're going to circle back to that yogurt thing in a minute when we get into more detail about his sanitarium. He was the director of the Battle Creek Sanitarium, which was a spa, a health spa, that was created by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And here is where they would help people purify themselves, become cleaner, better human beings. This was all also during the hygiene movement during the late 1800s. So there were things like bathing, washing your hands, and developing some pretty good healthy habits, at least when it comes to those things. <laughs> some famous people from history that went to his sanitarium would be J.C. Penny, Henry Ford, Amelia Earhart, Thomas Edison, C.W. Post, and former president William Howard Taft. John Harvey Kellogg was seen as what we would consider today a health guru, and he was one of the first of his kind. He coined the term biologic living, which was um, promoting, obviously, 
bathing, which, I mean, that's a good thing, so we'll give him a point there for that. Exercising, another point for that, at least. Those are some good things. <laughs> and then vegetarianism, yeah, abstinence, abstinence from alcohol, of course, as well. He saw that as one of the great evils of humanity. And just uh, a way to resist all carnal sin. So keep living a clean life. Also, his protocol involved every patient consuming a whole pint of yogurt a day, half through the mouth, half through um, the back door. Apparently, this was a, um, a common practice in order to introduce uh, bacteria to the gut flora. So I don't know if we could say he was the main creator of this, but definitely that was something that uh, patients would do alongside daily enemas as well. So there we go. And actually, John Harvey Kellogg believed that gut flora was one of the main influencers of temptation and desire in humans. So this is why he promoted daily enemas to his patients. He also performed them on himself after every meal. He invented a chair that would shake patients so violently that they involuntarily defecated. So I guess the enemas were not good enough when it came to that. And Towards the end of his lifetime, he also opened up a second health spa in Florida. So Battle Creek Sanitarium was in Michigan, and then he opened a second one in Florida. I do not know the name of it. I did not look into that, but I just thought that'd be worth mentioning. He was successful enough to open a second. A lot of famous and rich people did attend his sanitarium, and they also did outreach to poor individuals who didn't have access to help for their sinful, disgusting, hedonistic human nature. So let's see. I think we gave the brief history there. Let's get into the meat of it all. I mean, the non-meat of it all. I don't even know what you call that. <laughs> Upon doing a little research and just from knowledge that I have gained from self-experience, I will link some of these studies below for you to look at if you are curious or are not informed about this, but grains in particular have been linked to increased inflammation, harming gut bacteria, disrupting hormones, and contributing to ob obesity, just to name a few. And if you aren't sure about that last part, let's take a minute and think about when people are uh, raising cattle to sell them for beef. Uh, what do they do to fatten up the cattle before they send it off to market? Same thing they do with pigs and chickens as well. They feed them grains. So... Let's think about that. Why would they feed them grains if grains didn't make you fat? Just a little heads up there. Whole grains are no different and could even be worse because of how harsh their breakdown process is. It's no wonder that more people are becoming intolerant to grains, especially given that grains these days have been so genetically modified to increase their gluten content that it's just becoming absolutely unbearable for most people to digest or use for energy. And so all this to say that the invention of cereal took these things into account because actually J.H. Kellogg was hoping to create a food that would suppress human libido. John Harvey Kellogg believed that a bland diet was the secret to driving individuals away from sinful and especially sexual desires. And so he really advocated for eating as bland as possible, which is what started his search for the perfect easy breakfast since people were so inconvenienced from preparing, uh, preparing grain-based breakfasts. 
him and his younger brother started experimenting with recipes. They first came up with something similar to granola, but he was not very happy with that. And so they kept experimenting with different grains and eventually found out that if you toasted and pressed corn, that it would create something they called a cornflake, which was... I mean, definitely not easy to eat because apparently people would break their teeth on them, but I guess easy to package, convenient, they rolled with it. So they came up with cornflakes. They tested it on patients at the sanitarium and continued to perfect the recipe as they went along. And apparently patients loved it so much that when they left the sanitarium, they would purchase boxes to take with them. So this was kind of the start of the business, the distribution, and the mass production of it all. Now, John and his brother William Keith Kellogg disagreed a lot with the purpose behind the invention of cornflakes. John's vision was all about extinguishing the human sexual desire. He even was quoted to say that his purpose was about the reform and had nothing to do with the business. William Keith, however, saw great opportunity in this and wanted to create this into a business and advertise and market it to more and more people. John's view was he wanted more and more people to experience this and know about this, but it was not about the money for him. It was about purifying humanity of their sexuality. Big difference there. They disagreed a lot about this. John would let anyone who wanted watch the process of creating the cornflakes because he wanted more people to know about it and be able to do it themselves. William, however, saw the great potential in this and wanted to keep it a secret so that they could have a monopoly on the market. Now, one guest who ended up viewing this process named C.W. Post, and he went on to copy this procedure and start his own cereal company known as Post Cereals. He also later went on to start the company General Foods as well. William and John could not get along about the purpose behind cornflakes. William really thought that adding sugar would be a great marketing scheme to get more people to want them and, and buy them. John, however, thought this would defeat the purpose since his idea was that a bland diet was the way to purify people of their sin. And so they could not agree on this aspect nor on the aspect of letting the process be out in the open for all to see. So eventually they split ways. William bought out John's share of the company and he went to start his own factory, the Battle Creek Toasted Cornflake Company in the year of 1906. John ended up suing William over the rights for the name, for their last name to be used for the company because that is what he had been using and William was seeking to change his company name to his last name. So John sued William, William ended up winning and geniusly marketed this stuff to the public by telling them, wink at your grocer and see what happens upon which the grocer would give them a sample of the cereal and give them a taste for it so they would come back and buy it in stores. It was really a good business plan. William seems like quite the business guru of his time. So John and William split ways and William ended up winning the court case and getting the rights to the name Kellogg. And in 1920, he changed his company name to Kellogg's Corn Flakes. Now, during this time, John was still giving the corn flakes to his patients as he believed this was an important part of their protocol in the sanitarium. He just was not selling it to them during this time because he cared more about diffusing their sexual desire. So that was his purpose behind that. 
It's almost like eating meat is actually good for you and helps your system to run properly as nature and God intended. And he sought to destroy that and block those signals and destroy human health for his own agenda. So, do I sound biased? I'm sorry. But seriously, I'm going to link this below. I highly suggest reading it yourself because I really had to sugarcoat this and it's a lot better for people to just educate themselves and see the truth. I'm giving as much detail as I can, but like I said, I don't want this to be too explicit that people can't even listen to it, so I had to sugarcoat a lot of things. Yeah, there's a lot more to it, so definitely check that out. Now, just briefly, I'm going to discuss his uh, eugenesis title because during the end of his life he did dedicate himself toward actively pursuing eugenicism. One thing that he was looking to do was to legalize the sterilization of mentally defective persons as he called them. He co-founded the Race Betterment Foundation, and they started hosting conferences known as the Race Betterment Conference, which one event would be the Better Baby Contest, where white babies would be judged based on their breeding, and I guess the ones with the best genes or the most whiteness, I don't know, would win. It's really disgusting stuff that this guy was doing in his lifetime. And I also find it interesting how obsessed he was with children as well, because that was a large focus of his time. Also something to be aware of, he patented four different medical devices in his lifetime. One of them was an artificial sunbathing machine. I don't know if the chair happened to be one of those. I didn't see the other things listed. But another thing that he created during his time was a peanut-based meat substitute called Nuttos. I think that's very important for people to be aware of is that a company that may be near and dear to their heart and very sentimental from their childhood was actually seeking to harm them rather than nourish them. And I think it's very important for people to be aware of these things so that when consumers are supporting companies with their money, they can be aware of what exactly are they supporting. Most of these things have a hidden agenda, which is what I seek to expose through this series. I think if more people become aware of these things as the consumers, we have the power to change what's available to us and what is marketed to us in the stores. And if enough people were to stand up and stop supporting these companies, they would have to change their ways or start over from scratch. And I think it'd be very important for people to understand what these foods are doing to their bodies, how it's harming them, and even though they are marketed as heart healthy, they are actually the opposite. So I seek to expose these things and educate people on the truth behind the matter because I think it's very important to be well informed. Whether you choose to continue to support these businesses or not is completely your business. Being educated and having Knowledge is the best way to know how to move forward with the choices that you make. So I find that to be the most important. I want to get this story out there, which is why I've created this series. I have a lot of things that I am seeking to investigate and bring forward to you guys and present the information. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to link all of the sources that I went to in the description so that you can do your own research if you are interested or if you want to check on the facts that I have presented to you. I want to thank you so much for watching. If you found this to be informative in any way, please give it a like even comment for me and let me know. That'd be great to get some feedback. And also subscribe because this is a series now. I'm going to be releasing it weekly to discuss new topics all related to the food industry and putting some useful information out there for people. 
consolidated all into one place. You are definitely not going to want to miss out. I've got a lot of good stuff that I am looking into and I am excited to share the truth. It's about time we had some of that. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time.